So welcome to the next edition of the Rare Business Podcast. With me today, I have Stephen Arstall, who is the founder and CEO of, Ar- of Tower. Hi, Stephen. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me on your uh, podcast, Adrian. You're very welcome. Now, Stephen, for the benefit of our listeners and readers, can you tell us a bit about you and tell us a bit about the sort of the work that you do? Sure. So I'm, you know, I've been an entrepreneur for about the past 15 years. Mm-hmm. Um, in various businesses, but mostly around e-commerce and sort of internet uh, business models. And uh, that's sort of what I, I've been doing. My, my most recent company is Tower Paddleboards. Right. We're a uh, uh, direct-to-consumer uh, beach lifestyle brand. So we started off selling stand-up paddleboards. Uh-huh. Uh, and now we've expanded into you know surf, snorkel, uh, even bikes and skateboards and stuff like that. Okay. Um, but we're... We're sort of disrupting that market uh, because instead of selling through the traditional retail channels, we all go to the same manufacturers and sell you the same product, basically at half the price um, mm. that you get online. So, okay, that's what. But the reason that we are talking today, I mean, is that you've written this book called "The Five Hour Workday: Live Differently, Unlock Productivity, and Find Happiness," which is, I must say, um, and we were we were speaking off air as it was. And I congratulate you on the book because it's probably one of the few books I've read cover to cover recently. And uh, but so it's, I'm excited to talk about it because it's really interesting and, and uh, challenging ideas. But can you tell me a little bit about the book and tell me why you wrote it? Yeah. So uh, I mean, first off, I always like to gate this by saying that we're we're a high performing company. So right. Even though we're a, a paddleboard company, a surf company. Um, you know, a lot of people don't take that seriously where we're at in Southern California. Uh-huh. That's considered like a hobby business. Mm-hmm. Um, but two years ago, we were named the fastest growing company in San Diego. Yeah, um, that's a city of three million people. You know, and we were at this event with a lot of you know VC funded companies and tech companies and all of this. Mm-hmm. And here's a surf company uh, with five people in it that's doing five million in sales. Uh, last nice. year, last year we were ranked number number two thirty nine on the Inc. five hundred list of America's fastest growing companies. So we're a startup and we're really focused on hyper growth. Right. Um, but at the same time, you know, we we feel we work very efficient. And for the past, you know, 10, 15 years, I've been, you know, working in this model where I just come into my, you know, my office, get my work done and get out of there, mm-hmm. not managed by the clock at all. And I have a lot of entrepreneurial buddies who are doing, you know, frankly, the same thing. Mm-hmm. And these are the people that I see thriving in, in the economy. So, you know, one day it just sort of occurred to me that why don't we apply this, the same thing that I'm doing, you know, to my entire company? Can you, can you do that? And will that work? It's sort of an experiment mm-hmm. um, in a sense. And the, the, the basic premise of the, the five hour workday is you're putting a serious time constraint on people. Um, sort of the hypothesis for me in America today is that, you know, the best workers, knowledge workers, are getting two to three hours of like good work done, mm-hmm. but they're taking eight to ten hours to do it. You know, um, it's because- kind of, sorry, it's it's. I'll interrupt interrupt you there if I may, because sure. it's, it's really interesting. Because you, I saw a study a little while ago that said that they did an audit of people's time and and things in terms of the work yeah. that they did. Um, relative to their job description or the prime job responsibilities, and they said there was they estimated somewhere between forty five and fifty percent of all the things that people do, whether it's productive or unproductive sort of uh, activity, was not related to the primary job activity. <laughs> yeah, so that's funny. Um, yeah, we've got a lot of we got a lot of free time to sort of freewheel on whatever we want to well, do. Well, pointless meetings and things like that. Oh yeah, because. Frankly, what we you know need to get done today to even stand out in the workforce is just monumentally easier than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Sure. Uh, you know, my mom managed a credit union, um, and I would go into her office, you know, just 30 years ago, and she had a typewriter on her desk and a phone that was attached to the wall. I mean, she literally used whiteout. And there's statistics, and I quote this in the book: um, in the past 40 years, productivity in the U.S. has gone up 80 percent. Right. And wages have gone up 11 percent. Now, a lot of people, you know, look at that statistic and they sort of wring their hands on how bad, you know, workers are getting screwed here. You mm-hmm. know, why are, why are wages up only 11 percent if productivity is up 80 percent? Sure. Um, you know, I see this as a business owner 
I'm saying, what are you saying? We're only 80% more productive. I mean, literally, you know, my mom's office 30 years ago, you can get anything done. I mean, if the internet goes out today, we just all go home. Um, yes. that's, it's pointless, right? <laughs> I mean, we are entrepreneurs like myself and my friends, we're a thousand percent more productive. So if America's workforce is 80% more productive, they're doing something seriously wrong. And bosses across America and the world, I think, should be really pissed off about this. Um, you know, but we're not because productivity is up a little, little bit. You know, we're not paying workers very much. Uh, profits are, you know, through the roof. But we're really not, you know, doing doing it right because you know bosses are sort of wasting employees' time. Why keep them there that long if they're not really doing any work anyways? Yeah. And then employees, why are you, you know, spending all this time at work? We're really not doing any work. It's just this collective delusion on both sides. And the five-hour workday is basically a better model for this. I'm going to give employees their life back so they have a life very similar to what I have created for myself and entrepreneurs have created for themselves. And then they're going to, when they're in the office, they're going to work. Yeah. Well, so before we can talk about the, the kind of the what it is and how you, know, how you do it, I mean, let's kind of go back a little bit and, and tell me, because I mean, you spent a lot of time kind of almost in the book kind of getting under the skin of what it is the sort of the modern or rather not the modern but the traditional working day and the construct of it being an eight hour day and so on and so forth so um can you give us a little bit of background and what you went into what you find out when you did your research around the eight hour work day and kind of why you think it's actually kind of broken from a historical perspective yeah yeah definitely and this was part of the, the interesting part of, of writing this book. I mean, I didn't intend to write a book uh, when we started this. We just started this task like, you know, a year and a half ago. Right. Where I just came in one day and said, hey, we're going to do a three month test. We're going to, you know, go 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. straight through. We're going to get rid of lunch. Um, and you need to be able to get your work done or you'll be fired. Um, so put pressure on them, okay. give them their life back, and do that. But how did I arrive at that sort of five hour um, number? I mean, one, one part of it was I was looking at my entrepreneurial friends and what they were doing, mm -hmm. and I was like, why are these people successful? How can we work something more similar to that? And then I had to make it, frame it into what a company would do. So before I, I said, you know, what's, what's ideal here, I went and said, okay, well, why are we even working this eight hour day in the first place? And the, the, my assumption at the time is this is how it's always been and this is how it is always around the world. And I think that's the assumption that a lot of people have. Sure. But the reality is, um, even today, the work uh, week is much different in every different country in the world. Yeah. I mean, some countries work six tens in Mexico across the border, which Americans think is like, you know, this lazy country. They work six, eight hour days. Right. And I had no clue about this. I'm 20 minutes from the border. <laughs> uh, and in France, they have a 35 hour work week. And, you know, so it's really all over the board. And even the 40 hour work week in America is something that was frankly just invented in the early 1900s, um, you know, there was there was sort of a movement going, and then Henry Ford sort of rolled it out in a big way uh, with Ford Motor Company. Yeah, uh, and in why he did it was really the the important part here. So prior to that, in factories in America, you know, people were working 10 to 16 hour days on the factory floor. floor. Yeah, um, but you know, it wasn't a highly productive environment. They were largely leaning on brooms. But then the Industrial Revolution came along, mm -hmm. and all of these this machinery. Uh, that created efficiency for human bodies, and then the assembly line, which made all these processes go faster. Um, so all of a sudden, these people, you know, these machineries came came in, and all of a sudden, people were working ten to sixteen hour days, but they had to keep up with the assembly line. Right? It became unsustainable. I mean, you just couldn't do that for you know ten to sixteen hours a day because there was no breaks, there was no leaning on the broom. Sure. And so what happened? Like in the early 1900s in the U.S. It was like one half of 1% of the U.S. population was dying or being injured on the factory floor. This was like a serious health crisis. Yeah. And for Ford, Ford Motor Company, beyond people just getting injured, it was huge turnover rates. Like we're talking 60 or 70% turnover of staff from year to year. That's a big problem when you have a company, right? Sure. So Henry Ford said, you know, the world has changed. Let's, adjust, let's make an adjustment here. We're going to shrink this day down to eight hours a day. And we're going to double uh, workers' daily pay, and so that's what he did. You know, the next month he had you know ten thousand people standing at the door trying to get a job there. Yeah. So he basically stole all the good workers from everybody in the country, good factory workers. Um, within two years, he doubled profits of Ford Motor Company, mm -hmm. and in seven years 
he increased their market share to 61% of the worldwide auto industry. He basically took over that industry because he gave workers a better deal, got the better, best workers in his, uh, in his company, and they, they sort of took over. So that's what happened 100 years ago. And I, I've given you sort of background on why it happened and why the change worked. We fast forward 100 years, the exact same thing has happened for knowledge workers today. Right. Um, the, the, you know, the assembly line of today is really an assembly line of information flow. Mm -hmm. It's how they can you take a piece of information from one party, share it with the next party to move things along here. And so this is the world that knowledge workers work in today. And from you know those days when my mom had a typewriter and a uh, you know a phone attached to the wall to today, we have all of these tools that can make us work just tremendously fast. Sure. Um, and so, in, in uh, you know productivity is not up just incrementally; it's up 10x. Right. Uh, so it's really changed. But now you know workers have the ability to do all of this work again. We're being overworked because the mind can only concentrate for so long. Um, you know, so you can probably really get, you know, two to three hours of good work done before most people's brain is just fried for the day. Yeah. I'm talking of really concentrating, really focused quality work. Yet we're still spending these long hours. And then we take our smartphones home and on the weekend and evenings we're fielding emails and calls because we want to keep that assembly line of information moving. And it's critical because if you just stop for three days, it really slows things down. But the problem is we've moved to this 24-hour work cycle, and in America we have, um, and probably around the world, we have a lot of sort of health issues that are bubbling up around this, stress-related diseases, um, obesity in America. It's like, you know, 30% of the people are obese because we're, you know, sedentary at a desk for, you know, large chunks of our day. Sure. We're working longer and longer hours, and we're sort of getting very one-dimensional where we're just defined by work. Um, there's a study in the book about uh, child happiness in the U.S. Mm. Um, and the world. And they studied 29 industrialized countries around the world, the most industrialized countries, and rated them on child happiness. And the U.S. finished 26th on that. Um, that doesn't really make sense. I mean, we're the you know the wealthiest country in the world. We have all of these you know freedoms. Um, you know, and why are the children unhappy? Mm. It's because you know, both parents are working until seven o'clock at night. The, the children are sort of are put aside. We've become very focused on on that. Um, so that's sort of the history of it. Okay. And so, I mean, because that's what it's, it's, I mean, so I understand it's, you know, it's about, it's about productivity, it's about focus, it's about stripping out the, um, the, the, the slack, as it were, it's, 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 um, and, but also giving people back time to do other things, which, you know, so sort of gives them back sort of control of their life so there's not a slave to the, to, to, to work, but like, that's quite a big shift. So, so how did you manage the, the shift and was there sort of any fallout from that shift? Well, this is this is another thing that I, when I really started examining the historical perspective of how we think about work and how people think about work around the world, um, it's it's changed over time and it's very different. Uh -huh. um, in America today, we're we are very defined by our work, and if you work, you know, a ten-hour day, you're this good of a person, and if you can put in a twelve-hour day, you know, that's considered you know better. Yes. You're, you're a stronger person. So the, you know, the alpha male, you know, in the U.S. is, you know, a billionaire that works around the clock. <laughs> so um, we've become very, you know, focused on that, like like as if the point of our life is work. I mean, that's really kind of what it comes down to. And when I, I've done a lot of interviews on this, mm -hmm. and a lot of times people ask me, well, you know, isn't the point of work to, you know, to you know, be ambitious and, you know, get stuff done. And I'm like, no, I mean, we're not economic slaves. The point of life is to do whatever you want to do with your life. Yeah. Right. And so if you look at it throughout history, um, you know, in the times of the ancient uh, Greeks, work was actually considered a curse. It was considered, you were considered unsuccessful if you worked. Right. Yeah. And a thousand years after that, so a big chunk of human history has been work has been like, no, you don't, you don't want to do work. You want to do the rest of, you know, interesting stuff in life, whatever you want to do. Um, and then in these, in the 1600s and in Europe, um, sort of the religious institutions, they wanted to change that, basically. They wanted to, you know, get people, you know, working. So they, uh, it's called the uh, the Protestant work ethic was yeah. sort of invented and put upon people. And it said, you know, work is not only, you know, not bad and to be avoided, but work is, you know, holy now. This is how you're going to, you know, get into the promised land is if you're a hard worker. It's part uh, of so the struggle. 
yeah, they were basically trying to control people, right, is what the religious institutions were doing here. And how America was originally founded was the people that were saying, hey, you know, something, something, sco something scoopy here. We're going to go, you know, find Arist Aristotle's Eden over in the U.S. You know, yeah. we're going to go to new land and we're going to work enough to get by and, you know, enjoy our lives again. They were escaping this. So it's kind of ironic today that, um, you know, the U.S. and, you know, probably the U.K. too are some of the, you know, the leaders in this sort of, you know, identifying yourself by how hard you work. Yeah, um, it's 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 sort of insane. You know, yeah. where did it come from? And of course, you know, in in ancient, uh, you know, Greece, a lot of that um, the ability not to work was allowed by slavery. OK. OK. And obviously that's a horrible thing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, human slaves. But today, if you look, what's happening is software and machines have, you know, sort of enabled this same thing because they are sort of the, the slaves of today. And, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. So life has just become much easier because we've automated a lot of it and shifted off a lot of the heavy lifting to machines and software. And so we can honestly go back to that time. And it's just it's just a mind shift. But yeah, we've become so indoctrinated into how we value ourselves now mm -hmm. that though know, this happened 20 years ago, we're still working just the same, and it's it's just a collective delusion. So I mean the, I mean tell me I mean did you just come in one day? You did all this kind of work. You just came in one day and said, I think we should do this because this is going to help balance out kind of what we're doing and and give back people's lives and become less of a slave to the eight-hour work day, and we'll become more productive and more motivated, more efficient and things, and we'll just do it as a pilot and, and figure it out. Is that, I mean, you did that and and that was it? Or was it was there a bit, bit more of a cunning plan behind it? Well, it's, you know, I was, I had lost a, a really good employee, right? <laughs> Maybe a year before or so. And I was wondering why. It was, it was a young girl that I brought in and I started her at $40,000 a year working, you know, straight out of college within two years she was an excellent performer and within two years I bumped her salary to basically she was making $80,000 a year when she left mm -hmm. and she, we were this high performing company we're in action sports you know we've got Mark Cuban as an investor we were on Shark Tank yeah it's people didn't leave this company it was very easy to hire and I'm like why are people leaving this company it doesn't make any sense and then she left and went to another company I worked there for a year and then left and went out on her own right and and I'm thinking that doesn't make any sense, but that sort of, and when she was here, she wanted to do consulting on the side. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I need 100% focus on, on my business. I, I'm not going to allow that. And I think that's ultimately, you know, why she left. But I was thinking, well, that was kind of stupid, right? Like that was kind of having my blinders on. Like, what do I care if she works on the side as long as she's doing an excellent job here? Yeah. So it made me sort of rethink, um, you know, how we're going how we're gonna, to, you know, attract the best people to our company and then retain them because I think that is the key to having sort of a, a successful company today mm -hmm. is it's a war for talent. You've got to get the best people on your team and then you get out of the way and let them go. How do you do that? So that's really where I started to challenge like the way we were working. I thought maybe this company, maybe we're getting a little soft, you know, here, how can we, how can we change this? How can I get people working like me? So when we rolled it out though, it was literally sort of an overnight thing. I just came in and said, Here's what we're gonna do. You know, starting on Monday, you know, we're gonna move to a five-hour workday, 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. No lunch, um, and I, you know, so I'm gonna give you guys your life back. You're gonna have from one o'clock until you know 10, 11, whenever you go to sleep, every day of your life. Um, that's a huge chunk of time, and it's not an incremental change. That's a, again a 10x change in the amount of free time. You now have you know a work week that's better than most people's vacation weeks. Sure. And but, they, it, but it's also important to kind of add that that didn't had that had no impact on their salaries. It was just a purely we are going to put a constraint on the amount of time that we spend here. But the challenge is to get more done if uh, the same amount of work done, if not more, in that in sort of a, a, a smaller amount of time. Yeah, and that's a that's a critical distinction there. So I so I left out that part. But yeah, everybody was on salary, so their salary stayed the same. Mm -hmm. I mean. And, and when they were up for raises, the raises went exactly the same. And the, that the day that we rolled out the five-hour workday, we also rolled out 5% profit sharing. Right. So um, how, how that worked for our company was, say if someone was making $40,000 a year um, you know, before this, and we would work 2,000 hours a year, you know, your 40-hour work week, that was about $20 an hour is yeah. what they were basically earning before. 
after with the 5% profit sharing, now they're making about $48,000 a year. It's about an extra $8,000 per person you know, at the time just with our profitability. So now they're making 48,000, but that is over 1,250 hours because we've reduced the baseline down. Sure. So now they're making $38.40 an hour. Overnight change, their yeah. wage is nearly doubled. And the beautiful thing to the company is our expenses didn't increase one dime because we were only doing the profit sharing if we had profits. And it's not like, you know, we raised our expenses at all. So it was very, um, it, it's an, not really risky uh, thing to do. We also roll out healthcare at the same time. Mm-hmm. Uh, we rolled out this thing where we do what, what are called Tower Tuesdays. Mm-hmm. So to, to keep sort of the social aspect, because when, when people come to work, I don't want them chit-chatting over the water cooler or, you know, doing all of that. It's more come in, put your head down and work. But we wanted to still have the social element to our business so um, and to our staff. So every other Tuesday, we do some event like, you know, we went like go-kart racing or we went on a Segway tour or we go, you know, surfing or we'll go sailing or indoor skydiving. Sure. Those are just some of the things we've done over the past two months. Um, and so we and then we also do two uh, company trips per year. We went to uh, where we go. It was a. Uh, uh, the Sundance Film Festival. Okay. And Utah. Did like ski trip, whole company goes, and we just take, you know, three days or whatever. We're doing another one this fall down to uh, Puerto Vallarta. We've got a big house on the beach, and there's like, you know, 15 of us going, significant others and stuff. And so we wanted to like give people really this sort of life that entrepreneurs had created for themselves. And so that's, it changes the mentality of how people think about work. Yeah. If, if it goes from being, like work is just sort of the central focus of your life that occupies a good chunk of your time and all of your basically during the weekday. Um, and then you, you do that all. So you have a, you know, a couple weekends and two weeks a year. Um, it's a very dim sort of dismal outlook. Um, in, in the U S like 70 to 80% of workers are basically dissatisfied with their work. Sure. So they're not even enjoying that time when they're at work. So, so we wanted to shift it to be more like how I think of work and how my entrepreneurial buddies, it's just this thing we sort of do that affords us this extraordinary lifestyle. So I wanted my workers to have that mindset change of, hey, work is just something we do in the morning uh, that affords us this incredible lifestyle. So it was really important to me like to, to get out of there before lunch, right, if you yeah. could do it. So that's how I sort of came up with the, the five hours. I, I figured how long can people go without eating? And, you know, what time can we start and can we push lunch back a little bit? And so that I felt that like eight to one was was good. But so let's um, I mean, let's go down to sort of brass tacks. So what has been the impact on the business? So the first year that we rolled it out, so between 2014 and 2015, and we rolled it out June 1st of 2015. So we were seven months in that year. Uh-huh. We, our revenues went up uh, something around 42 percent, I believe. Right. And then profitability was up over uh, north of 30%. So all of a sudden, you know, we're making more money, we're more profitable, and we're working fewer hours. Like there, and this was an, uh, you know, it was done as a three month test. I yeah. kind of felt my employees were getting a little soft. I'm gonna put pressure on them, have them figure out how to do their job faster, and then we'll roll back in the fall and we'll be, you know, twice as productive. But the reality is, like nothing bad happened. Right. <laughs> And, and it was still, we were growing. So I'm like, well, it was pointless what we were doing before. We're just going to stick with this. So, so um, that's what we've done. It's been, you know, a year and a half now. So the, the interesting thing, though, is that, so you've got, um, you do a lot of your sales on the website. Um, so, but that's open sort of 24 seven. But then there's yeah. kind of, because I'm, I'm really interested in, in all things sort of customer service, customer experience and all that type of stuff. And sure. the, the interesting thing that I, that I, um, found was that t- well rather why don't you tell me the impact on the five hour work day on your shop opening hours and also your customer service um, helpline opening hours and what's been the impact on that as well yeah so it's not just like we're this online company we just changed our office hours of a bunch of marketing people so we have a physical store front we changed the hours there before it was like nine to five mm-hmm. um, and we just changed that to eight to one, same thing. Um, and what happened, because you know people go to our website, they see when we're open, and they just sort of adjust. So the same number of people come in and just in a shorter period of time. So customers self-adjust. Right. Um, 
that was something I was honestly really worried about. We don't do a huge percentage of our sales, you know, local because we're a worldwide brand that sells online. Yeah. Um, but it was something that I was just like, yeah, you know, we're probably going to take a, you know, 30, 40% hit in our, uh, our revenue and number of customers that come in. Didn't happen at all. It didn't change at all. You know, it was still sort of growing steadily like it had throughout, you know, the history of our company uh -huh. um, because people just sort of self-adjusted. We're not a convenience store. Like we've, we've uh, you know, gone to this mindset in our economy that everything needs to be open, you know, 24 seven and you, you just have to do that. But I'm, we're a retailer, right? Uh -huh. And so I'm competing in a world where I see physical, you know, retail stores going out of business, like on a regular basis. Uh -huh. Like it's just a bloodbath in there. And who's taking over the retail world? Amazon.com, right? Sure. You can't physically go into a store there. You can't even call them on the phone, mm -hmm. you know? So a lot of these things that I was really worried about, like reducing our customer service hours on the phone too, and you know, reducing the shop hours, didn't really have this negative effect. And in fact, they have a positive effect. And uh, this is sort of the counterintuitive thing here of why the five hour work day forces your company to be more efficient and more effective as a company. Yes. Like Amazon's customer service is incredible because, but when without answering the phone and without having the storefront, because they have to get all the information out there, they have to anticipate what the customer needs and put that information out there. And so, even for like returns, like there's a return label in the box for you, right? <coughs> Where so customers can basically self service. And a lot of people would say that you know, customer service is you know, handling issues as they arise, you know, being available to handle customer problems. Yeah, but that's just putting a band aid on, on a problem. Like when you say, look, like we can't answer the phone, what processes do we have to fix so that customers have this great experience? That's improving a business. That's improving the customer experience. Yeah. But us putting out fires all day with angry customers, it's not customer service. That's, you know, after the fact customer service. You went, so when we went to, you know, uh, shrinking the time uh, that we had to call, because we get a lot of phone calls, right? Yeah. Like that person was kind of, kind of sweating that. But it forced us to say, how can we let customers self-serve more? Mm -hmm. So we started, you know, doing. We took our, our frequently asked questions page on the website and really blew that up. Sure. And put a lot more information on there. We started doing these little video, you know, things with people uh, and, and putting that online so we we could answer the questions in that way. And it forces you to basically get creative. And I think this is how you improve processes. This is how. Um, you know, technological advances happen is when you put constraints on thing and you have to force a creative solution. Mm -hmm. That's what five hour work day is about doing for your business processes in, you know, small companies that don't have efficiency experts and they don't have all these layers of management that are doing that for you. You put your workers to work doing that for themselves. But I think, I think what's fascinating is what you're saying is because it, I mean, you, there's an old, there's a saying that, that you reminded me of, which said, um, um, necessity is the mother of all invention. Yeah. Um, and I guess what you're doing, about you talk about putting constraints on something, if you constrain the time, then you, that's why you're creating the necessity because it forces you to be creative. Um, yeah, And I exactly. think that's the thing. It's almost this kind of thing. So if we've got space, then we blow up into space. It's a bit like kind of people, it's like whether you pay somebody sort of, you know, Thirty thousand dollars, or thirty thousand pounds, or a hundred thousand dollars, hundred thousand pounds, almost guaranteed that both people are going to spend all of the money because they yeah. they just expand into the resources unless you're unless you're this fabulous saver. The but because it's, I mean, I, I think that it's the same with time. You know, I think what you're demonstrating is that actually, one, it's that if you constrain the time and take away the inefficiency, it forces you to be creative and really, really rethink what you're doing about your business. Um, and because it also takes something which is the almost like a s sacred cow, which is the eight hour workday and going, actually, no, it's not sacred anymore. We can do something different. But I think what's also a really interesting thing, and I'm pretty sure that you've probably seen this, is if you give people the opportunity to have space and build a, you know, have a, more of a life more outside of work, then they get a chance to do more things. Then actually what it does, it nurtures their own creativity and space to think as well. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's incredibly important here because we're not, um, you know, the work that we do today is not, you know, physical labor, a lot of it. Yeah. So 
like if you've got some some guy that his job is to move rocks you know and he works five hours or he works 10 hours he can you know move about twice as many rocks in 10 hours aside from you know his body just getting tired and he works at a slower pace yeah. right and then you put machineries in there and then you know even the, the the wear and tear on his muscles is less so he can really do twice as much work you know or 10 times as much work whatever the machine can do but with the knowledge working world, it's not that same way. Like you can't get twice as much work done in 10 hours as in, in five hours because it's the, the quality of work is, is really critical, critical. And who is doing that work, right? There's a famous uh, you know, quote by Bill Gates that says, you know, one, one sort of brilliant programmer is uh, worth 10,000, you know, basically average or good programmers. I mean, that's sort of the power curve we, we live under today with, with like knowledge work. It's like, you know, some people and some, you know, work is just incredibly productive and other work is incredibly improductive. You know, okay. 10,001, that's probably, you know, an exaggeration, obviously, but anybody that's worked in any office in the world just knows there's people in that office, some people that work at three times the speed of other people in that office. This is everywhere. Okay. And what we're trying to do with this is we're trying to attract those people that work three times as, at the speed and give them a better deal. And they were trying to repel the other people. That's why when, when I rolled this out, I said, like, if you can't figure out how to do this, you will be fired. I do not want you in my company, you know. And to be perfectly honest, I think there's some people that this just doesn't work for. This right. concept, they've been so indoctrinated into the eight-hour workday. And my work is not about how productive I am. It's about how long I, I work in the office. And there's a lot of people in corporate America that, you know, come in earliest and leave latest and do nothing. And those people are promoted and it's insanity. I mean, I think, but I think the, I mean, I think whilst I congratulate on what you're, you know, what you're trying to, what, you've, what you're trying to achieve and what you've done and how you're going about it. I think there's a, a in, and, and I think the people should ex think about and explore this kind of five hour workday um, approach, not just specifically because it's about five hours, but it's about, Think, rethinking the, the standard workday, but I think there's there's I guess there's different uh, options along that sort of spectrum. There's and, and principles that you can apply. You can shift from where you are to kind of to follow in the you know in your sort of footsteps, but you could also take the same principles and apply them to um, other areas. So, for example, just it's almost like just apply different time constraints to some of the stuff that you do to make yourself focus and be more productive and hopefully to force a, a more creativity, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, so that's that's the, the real underlying thing here is that the lack of constraints in business is a, is a horrible thing. Yeah. Uh, and even in government, this is why government spending just goes you know awry and the projects take forever and they're not very effective because they've basically taken the constraints out of everything. If they run out of money, they raise taxes. You know, and <laughs> there are no constraints. They'll just hire more people and they just bloat and bloat and bloat and bloat. And then what you have happening in the, in the real world today is you have, you know, startups, three guys in a garage are, you know, they have no money and they have no time because they only got three people working on this. And they, you know, create something and they're forced to create, find creative solutions. Yeah. And, those three people will upset a $100 million company that has 1,000 people in it. And you can almost bet on the three guys in a garage today. Yes. You know, because this, because how the world has changed and how knowledge work has become much more leverageable with software tools and you know everything, it's, if you're not putting those constraints, you're not finding those creative solutions. So we have, like, I have a companion uh, site to the book. It's called 5hourworkday.com. Uh-huh where we, you can go there and you can get the first 48 pages of the book for free, you know, download the PDF. But we also have a PDF on there that has, that lists like these 38 productivity tools that we've identified, that I've identified over the last 10 years, and my staff has identified over the last year and a half, of tools that make us, you know, allow us to do our jobs faster. And they're broken down into categories. So there might be, you know, three or four tools for your HR department, and mm -hmm. there might be three or four tools for um, sourcing, and there might be you know, three or four tools for communication, or or whatever, for every different type of job that you're in, there are these tools out there that make your job 100 times faster, and nobody is using these tools. They're free in a lot of instances, or really cheap, yeah. but people, there's no pressure on people to use these. So, you know, that's what this is about, too. It's that you need to put in those constraints so you find these creative solutions, and it doesn't have to be like, you don't have to, you know, 
be some genius that invents something new. You just have to look for the tools that are there already and just use them, you know, or use them better. Excellent. So, um, so I'm just kind of conscious of um, sort of time, but you know, so if I if if I got somebody listening in to this or reading the highlights and they're going, "Wow, that's fascinating," I'd love to um, experiment with that in our firm or consider kind of going down that sort of route in our firm. I mean, where would you start? Do they just kind of walk in on a you know on a announce on Friday that we're moving to this sort of this system and and then implement it on Monday, or is there a, should they be doing something else first? Well, I would say sort of do a personal experiment too. Just one day, just do it yourself. Uh, okay. Especially if you're like a boss and you can, you don't have to answer to anybody else. Yeah, yeah. Just, do it. just put that pressure on yourself where you're not going to have the lunch in there and it's five hours and you got to get that work done because people already do this. Like if you're going on vacation yeah. and you're, you know, you need to cut out of the office or whatever, you figure out how to get your work done. You put, it's like finals week, right? Yeah. And that's the idea of you know, putting that pressure and just working a little faster. And that's an immediate thing. I'm not even talking about the long term benefit of finding tools and completely different ways to do what you were doing before. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying just cut out the waste and that can be an immediate benefit. So try it yourself and, and just see how, how this works. And then if you're going to roll it out for a company, there is a risk free way to do this. Yeah. Um, you do exactly what we did with the test, um, but you do it just as a test. Yeah. Um, so you say, you know, summer hours, three months. I'm going to give everybody their lives back. The, the, so that's the give. The ask is you have to figure out how to do your job in five hours or you will be fired. Yeah. And you put that pressure on them. And so you get them for three months um, becoming sort of independent uh, productivity experts on whatever it is their job is and you know, tool identifiers. And they will you know, spend those three months and they'll be grateful, that, honestly, because their life will it completely changes. I mean, when you, when you shift those hours, people won't believe it at first and they'll be bored because they have, you know, they don't even have anything to do. Sure. They'll have to stuff to do, but they'll go to work and find ways to be more productive. Then when you roll back, you know, you'll have people that are twice as productive. Everybody will have basically gone through this intensive training program of how to do their job faster. And then you can leverage that, you know, in the fall. So you've given them time back. It didn't cost your company one dime more because their salary is still the same. And you've done this test and, you know, just just call it a test, and we're going to try and figure out how to be more productive. And I'm going to give you guys your summer off, and then, you know, maybe if it goes incredible, maybe next summer we'll do the same thing. Fantastic. So, something as easy as that. It's tough to give it to people and take it away. You sure. But if you do something like that, I think, I think you could be really surprised in in what happens. I mean, like in our company, um, like the shipping department, we did this as well, mm-hmm. and. You these guys, it's just, you know, two guys in the shipping department there and we have a, you know, a big warehouse and they got to ship out packages and the number of packages they have to ship out literally goes up every year, but we haven't had it added head count for the last three years. And when we rolled to this, you know, before that they were doing, it was about one package was about five minutes, um, is to, to do all of the, the shipping and the sending the customer the information. And so they had existing software on the computers. They figured out how to use that software better. I mean, they were using it already, but they figured out how to really test the limits of this software. They completely reorganized the warehouse. They you know, put everything in its place and then put the sort of shipping department in the middle of the warehouse instead of on the edge of the warehouse. They got it down to like 2.6 minutes per package. Right. With no oversight or insight for me. This is something they could have already been doing, but they just didn't do it. And a lot of... You know, people in big companies will just say, well, all of your processes are broken. But, you know, we don't have like layers of management. When we rolled this out, we had seven people in our company. Everybody needs to figure this stuff out on their own in a flat organization. Mm -hmm. And unless you're putting those those pressures in there, they don't figure it out. Fascinating. That's brilliant. Um, So, Stephen, I have a couple of questions I want to ask as as we wrap this up. And the first one is um, is this. So... I think I mentioned when, before we started the interview that, so I published a book with Pearson uh, back in April of this year in the UK, and then July, it came out in July in, in the States called How to Wow. And a whole, okay. bunch of, how, whole bunch of ideas around how to improve service and, and sort of experience. But here's the thing that I've been doing over the last kind of few months is I've been routinely asking people as I've been doing these interviews, what is wow service or wow experience to you and what should firms do be doing more of to be able to get closer to being able, being able to deliver that? Yeah, so there's something that we've rolled out and it really came from a, another company. And so, you know, I bought a, a car, it was a, you know, a Porsche, and 
it was the first time I bought a new car in, in my life, right? Right. And so, you know, I bought the car, and then maybe after I had the car for three months or four months, um, you know, I got, and when I was at the car dealership, they, they helped me like set up my phone. So, like, you know, Bluetooth and the car would talk and everything like that. And then, so I'm driving in my car one day, and it was, I think it was like the day after like daylight savings time or whatever, and my clock was off basically. And so they called and said, hey, how's everything going with the car? Just check it, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have any questions? And I'm like, yeah, actually I do have a question. You know, my daylight savings just happened and it, and they said, yeah, that's why we called. Um, we wanted to make sure you could, you know, switch your, your clock over. And I'm like, this is incredible. Like these people anticipated this. They called me, you know, at the right time and just did that. And that's sort of that proactive, um, you know, customer service yeah. where usually some companies calling, hey, we'd like you to do a short survey or hey, I want to pitch you on this new product or something like that. No, it was an existing company that I had an existing relationship that was calling to check in with me to make sure you know, that if they could do anything to help me and they were doing it at a time where they knew I probably did need help. Um, so that was sort of wild customer service and we've implemented that at our own company. Like we call people you know, a couple months after they've got their board and yeah. we just ask them, hey, this, I'm not gonna take any of your time here. I'm just calling to check up to see how everything's going with your board, if you're having any problems, if you had any questions that I can answer. If not, you know, I'm, I'm off. I'm not gonna waste any of your time here. Sure. And we call it uh, Project Happiness. Right. And we, it's this active, you know, ability to go out and market to our existing customers in a way, just how can we be helpful? And we're, we're just trying to do it as just a give because we, we want to sort of surprise and delight them like that Porsche, you know, dealer did to me to the point where they say, hey, that was that was kind of nice. Then they get that warm, fuzzy feeling if they're, you know, referring anybody, um, you know, to buy a paddleboard, you know, they're going to tell them to, to go buy ours. Sure. And I think in, you know, the modern world, like people don't even answer their phone anymore because they're so afraid. Like everybody always wants something from you. Yeah. It's never this give, right? So something simple like that is just like it's a, it's a shock and awe in today's world <laughs> you know? yeah it's so. kind of surprising that kind of sometimes the, the you know the simplest things um and and sometimes almost the most human things can be the kind of the you know the, the things that are the most outstanding things yeah that's and this is okay so another critical thing here is like when we answer the phone right like we pick up the phone you know we don't put people into a phone tree you know we're, we're not trying to automate things. Like we're an efficiency minded business, mm -hmm. but we're not trying to automate things that create hassles for our customers. And I think this is where a lot of people um, get automation wrong. Yeah. What you should be automating. Because you're a lot of companies are automating the wrong things. You know, you we, we say we want to scale the unscalable. So yeah. like our customer service people, we have the best people in the company. Like literally when anybody comes into the company, they spend the first year in customer service basically. And that's so we have you know intelligent people talking to you, not some customer service person who just you know is paid six dollars an hour and doesn't know anything, right? Sure. And you know, we want to answer that phone. And so that's this is, you know, we feel as like a, an online company, we even have an advantage. I mean, we answer the phone, you know, and give people that sort of personal touch. And you don't want to automate those things. No. You know, auto responders and all that is just nonsense. Uh, you want to automate how you work so you work faster, but you do want to give that personal touch. Perfect. So, um, Stephen, that, that brings me to my final question that I always ask at the end of these interviews, and it's this. Is there anything that you would like to shamelessly plug? <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, it definitely, I mean, if somebody's in the market for a paddleboard, you know, come check us out. It's uh, towerpaddleboards.com. And then um, we also have something which is, is kind of interesting, and it, it coincides with our five-hour uh, workday. And you can find anything for five-hour workday at fiveourworkday.com. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have a magazine. Uh, it's The URL is tower.life. Right. And this, this is a beach lifestyle magazine. It basically is a magazine designed to – uh, show people sort of in a more extraordinary way of living and give you ideas of ways to spend your time. So we've shrunk down your work day. Now you're going to, you know, have from one till 11 o'clock every day. What do you do? You know, so that's what this magazine is about. It's just helping people, um, you know, find more interesting things to do and, and live. And it's, and it's just a, a content thing. You get uh, two emails a week. Uh -huh. And, uh, 
you know, it's we're not trying to sell anything. There's no advertising. There's no monetization plan on this business. It's just this is our brand, and this is some cool stuff that's going on. And you might find some inspiration there. Perfect, um, St- Stephen. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and I'm really excited about some of the things that you're doing. And and I'll make sure that all this gets kind of edited up and linked up and things. But um, we're an extraordinary story, and 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 congratulations on. You know, changing the work day, at least for the people in your kind of um, in 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 your company and in, in your sort of environment and community, and also spreading the word through the book. So that's been fascinating, and and so thank you for your time today. That's been brilliant. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity to be on your show, Adrian. You're welcome.